What's important? What do you want? Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kenneth. These guys have been great. And everybody who's joined us, thanks so much for being with us today. Let me invite you to start by listening to the impulse to breathe. We did this last week a little bit. The challenge this week will be to try and maintain this practice throughout the exercises that we're going to do today. If you have any difficulty locating the impulse to breathe, just don't breathe for a minute. And you'll find that there is a force that seems to be breathing you. Now, if I asked you to take a deep breath by your own volition, you would recognize that was you breathing. When we simply allow the breath and the impulse of the breath to breathe us, so to speak, would we say that is us breathing or not us breathing? And this distinction between these aspects of self and bringing these into a unified field is very essential aspect of the practice. As I said, I'm going to tell some stories. It's up to you to decide through your practice, through your experiential practice of these exercises, whether or not what we're saying here is of value to you, whether or not it's true. And the only way you can do that is by allowing yourself the experience. So the first part we're playing with here is recognizing that there is this force that is activating our life, activating our breath, and without it, we're not here. Very shortly, we're not here. This, I would say, is the most fundamental aspect of your being, your direct connection to the spirit. And if you breathe perfectly in harmony with it, if you find yourself listening to it in the spirit of doing exactly what it's asking, or how it's guiding or moving with it in that way, in the same way that you would harmonize or move at the same speed or in the same direction, seemingly with a partner in a dance or in Aikido, something starts to change in your life. Now, we did a couple other breaths. I'm going to go through them very quickly. My hope in these four classes is to share with you all the most important pieces of the learning that I've come across in my, whatever it's been, almost 60 years of study now, 57 years of study in these arts. And the things that have been important in making my life better, uh, in making my life more enjoyable, and making my contribution to the world more positive than negative. The second breath we did was adding to the impulse to breathe, both on the in-breath and the out-breath. And I'm going to leave you with that one. There are notes on it, and I would say to everyone and anyone, you're always welcome to contact me. Also, Lauren and Kenneth have been more than generous in their availability to help anyone and everyone with the technical issues, with the questions around the art, any way that we can be of service. And I would add to that, last week, one of the participants, when we were doing this breathing, started to say they were feeling a little funny or a little dizzy. And my sense is when you do play with breathing exercises, that's certainly a possibility. So you always want to be somewhere safe, not while you're driving, uh, probably not even standing up if you're working with exercises you're not familiar with. But what it really guides us to is the essence of what I would say my study and what I hope to share with everyone is listening to your inner teacher, always listening to your somatic awareness or the deeper aspect of yourself. So if we're doing a breathing exercise and it starts to feel uncomfortable, I would say keep yourself in a comfortable realm. If we're doing a stretching exercise and it starts to hurt. I would say keep yourself in a comfortable realm. Now, Mr. Tohei used to say, there's hurt that feels better and there's hurt that feels worse. So if we do some simple 
exercise and it feels good to kind of stretch it a little bit, then that's fine. That kind of call it pain or discomfort where you're stretching who you are a little bit and it works for you. Never abandon your inner teacher. Uh, we're not doing a drill instructor thing here. We're just guiding you into some experiences that you can play with. And the main thing that's going to be important here is for you to play with them on your own as the time that we have here is relatively short. So I mostly introducing exercises. Uh, there will be a record of them. I also encourage you to keep your own record. I will be sending out notes like I did last time and uh, give you a chance to play with them on your own, at which point if you have questions, we're certainly available. So the main focus here is staying in this connection to that impulse that's breathing you or that the you that you know is unifying with the aspects of yourself that are less conscious, that we're less aware of, that we tend not to pay as much attention to. And that experience of the impulse to breathe and bringing our attention into connection with the impulse to breathe starts to unify us. It creates a very different field of being and very different powers appear. So I'm going to show you one more breath here. It's a nice one to play with in terms of this same process, maybe even almost a variation. It's called Masogi breathing, and it's very common in the old days, especially when Mr. Tohei was chief instructor. So it's breathing in through the nose, and they usually do a, a visualization of the breath coming in through the nostrils and on each side coming down both sides of the spine to the very tip of the spine. And then when you exhale, you exhale through the mouth with an H-A sound. <sighs> and you reverse that. So we're just gonna do three of those. I'll leave you to practice them on your own. Again, let me know if you need anything more. And, and do feel free to stop me here, uh, unmute your mic and ask any questions if I lose you, if what I say isn't clear, or if you're having any difficulties whatsoever. Uh, you're not interrupting me, I'm here for you. That's why we're doing this. So they used to do with two little wood blocks that they polished very precisely. I'm just going to clap my hands, start breathing in through your nose, visualization over the top of the head, down the spine to the tip of the spine. And then exhaling with a And then you drop the head just a little at the end, squeeze that last bit of breath out. And appreciate what you feel, how you feel, what changes in how you feel, especially on the exhale. Okay, you can continue that on your own as we're doing this. You can go back to the extraordinary listening breath and most likely you'll lose that. And I will try to remind you, but try to remind yourself to try and learn to come back to that. And I do remember someone in the last class was asking, well, what is this about? And both of these breaths have a way of unifying your energy and your energy system or the you that allows the energy to flow. So Bob talks often about opening and settling. And opening, we're not really changing our physical body, we're changing our somatic awareness, our sense of ourselves, how we're feeling. And as you do that, you can feel the inner penetration of the oxygen through the system. And you wouldn't know that's what it was necessarily, but you can either feel a glow or a release or a relaxation an opening, a vitality, all the words are going to fall short. But your own experience will tell you what we're talking about, and you can apply your own words. And if you find one that works exceptionally well for you, please feel free to share. Does someone have a question?
Yes, Sensei, this is Michelle. Hi. 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 Hello. Thank you so much. Just a technical question. The breath in is down on the back of the spine, and it is the breath out up the front? No, they, they follow the same path in and out. The in breath is through the nose, the out breath is with the out the mouth with that <sighs> sound. And it's, they're both down the back of the spine. Yeah, the image is it's going up over the top of the head and then down the spine. And if you can play with it both sides uh, of the, that little ridge that falls down the center of the spine. But it, it's your imagination at that point. And I think as you play with it, you'll start to have some feeling or experience with it that's, that will guide you. And again, I would say play with it for a few days if you've got a question. After you've tried it a little bit, we can come back to it again, email me, whatever. Uh, be happy to help in any way I can. And we will revisit these quickly again next week. All right? I would like to do, is that okay, Michelle? We good? Yes, thank you so much. I was not clear on that. Thank you. Thank you. And, and again, most of these, I would say, hold them all very loosely. They're... They're like a recipe, you know, maybe you want a little more cinnamon in your cookies or a little more sugar or whatever. Uh, they're just basically something to start with as you play with them. And if you play with them gently and don't force, never force against what feels right to you, your own inner teacher will start to guide you as to what's best for you at this moment, just like the impulse to breathe is telling you how to breathe at this moment. Okay, we talked about when you breathe, uh, at a certain volume, you can hear the breath. When you breathe a little bit softer, there'll be a, a borderline where all of a sudden you don't really hear it. And then if it goes any slower than that, it becomes silent. You don't hear it. Usually it takes a little breathing till you've got enough oxygen in all the cells that you can slow the breath down to that level. So again, listening to your inner teacher, working at what's comfortable for you. And then if you continue in that silent breath, there's a softening and opening that allows the oxygen to exchange at the cellular level. The cells become vital at a point where you can slow the breath yet further and there'll be a borderline again where you not only can't hear it, you can't feel it. It's what I call the invisible breath. And I think if you play with these four breaths, the extraordinary listening breath, simply listening to the impulse to breathe, it's the easiest one to do, takes the least attention, can be done in the middle of a meeting. Uh, I particularly like it when uh, tension starts to increase for myself. And that can be just me arguing with myself, getting into an argument or just having difficulties in a conversation with someone else. Uh, if you've ever had one of those places where uh, you just start to feel uncomfortable in a relationship or a situation. And if you go back to the extraordinary listening breath, I think you'll find you're able to listen more openly to whatever the other person is saying and respond in a more harmonious way. Oh, sensei talked endlessly about the fact that we're always creating reciprocating echoes. And so as we come into, I say like charity, harmony begins at home. As we come into a more harmonious state with ourself, it's just natural that we create more harmony in the relationships with others and in the world that we live in. It may not seem sufficiently major in situations, but it's still the best thing you can do. So coming back to this sense of resonance that we're always creating these reciprocating echoes. If you want to just feel into your body and stay with the breath if you can. And then I'm going to play with a little story here. You're going to dinner tonight with a couple that doesn't get along very well. And I think if you just have that experience for a moment, everyone knows what I'm talking about. If there's anyone who doesn't Stop me and let's, let's explore it a little bit. But that sense of discomfort, is that fair? Anticipation may be another word. And the words are always going to fall short. The Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao. The word is not what it describes. 
But if you can picture that feeling of that tension, that, that resonance that's going on between them, you can't not be part of it in a way. At the same time, if you could imagine, play the thought experiment here of feeling you were going to dinner with a couple that gets along really well, that are very, very beautiful together. And if you can feel immediately the change in the feeling in your body, is that, is that fair? In your, the state of energy, your openness, your presence. Now, if anyone's not with me here, I think you better stop me. But if you're all with me, then what I want to say is that sense of disquiet between a couple that when they just don't get along together and they're always kind of nagging at each other, we're all made of a masculine and a feminine. Our mother and our father unify at some point to create new life. And when the masculine and feminine natures within you, as we all have that combination, are having a hard time with each other, uh, we don't want to go to dinner with you either. On the other hand, when you do something, and there are a million practices, the extraordinary listening breath is one. Chanting is another, and we're going to do that in just a second. It starts to unify the masculine and the feminine, the creative and the receptive, the you that you know and the you that's operating at a more, at a subtler level, at a less conscious level. So staying with the extraordinary listening breath, let your masculine and feminine have a nicer dialogue together. Well, sensei used the expression one plus one equals one. What he meant is these two aspects unify into a single field. There are two forces that create the existence, that create the creation. And those two forces together are the force of creation that produces everything that we know. And the more you're in harmony with that, the more you feel yourself as part of that, not exactly separate and yet somehow distinct at the same time, that's what we would might, might call the approach to the floating bridge. So I want to do one more quick breath exercise, and then I'd like to start to move towards movement a bit. And that exercise would be chanting. For the moment, why don't you sound your sound with your microphone muted and, and just join me in a little chant together, and, and uh, hopefully someday we'll get to sit in a circle and do it with our, our full voice. But if we move from the invisible breath to the audible breath, so, I'm sorry, to the silent breath, to the audible breath, as you start to tighten the vocal cords a little bit, and you're breathing out, ah. now that's an actual tension that's going on that keeps your throat or your vocal cords tight enough so that when the air moves through them, it produces sound. Otherwise, you just get the breath sound, or if you get softer than that, we get the silent breath and eventually the invisible breath. So I'm going to invite you now, listening to your own impulse to breathe, breathe in on your own timing. Don't necessarily chant on my timing, but join me as you feel appropriate. And let's just do again three or four of these, and then we're going to move on. So breathing in on your own impulse and making the sound that's appropriate for your body at this moment in time according to how you feel, just kind of a sigh. Ah. And I'd like to invite you to notice the vibration in your system as you breathe in now. When you make the sound, feel it vibrate. Notice where you feel the vibrations and if there are areas of the body that don't. Ah. Do two more. A little louder. Ha. Ha.
Okay, and I'm going to suggest that uh, brief as this exercise is, it's an introduction, and I hope you'll, if you haven't done chanting before, you just play with it a little bit. And again, play with whatever sound is appropriate, whatever volume is appropriate, whatever length is appropriate. Feel it in any way that's playful for you, meaning you're opening yourself to what you experience. And hopefully when we do this a little bit next week, as we'll focus a little bit more towards the meditative side and try to combine the meditation, the motion, and the breath, uh, you may have some further questions. We may be able to take it to a deeper level. So I'm going to move on a little bit towards movement at this point if we're ready. But again, let me take a minute, remind you to listen to your impulse to breathe and say, would anyone like to open their mic, ask any questions, clarify anything before we move on here so that, again, my hope is we haven't done that much with it. It probably has not changed your state of being all that much. Although if you're sensitive, maybe a little. But if you play with it between now and the next time we get together, I think you'll find that it does. I'm not hearing anyone, and that's fine. If anyone does have anything, please, again, don't feel like you're interrupting. Okay. So Osensei talked about eight powers. One of them is stillness. One of them is movement. So let's experiment with stillness for just a moment. We've been pretty still, but I'm, I'm assuming we've been moving around a little bit. So let's start to look for a stillness. And the, the thing I'm going to share for an intro to that is my introduction to meditation for people who are antsy or live at the pace of modern life is what I call microdosing meditation. And it's a three-second exercise that I def define with the terms align, allow, appreciate. So if you'll align your body, and the way you do that is very much that exercise we did last time. You go forward and back. You can go side to side. And start with movements that are big enough for you to feel, and then like we did with the breaths, move from the obvious to the more subtle, smaller and smaller increments, until you feel like there's nowhere to go. And then if you stay there for a moment, usually your sensitivity increases. And you can even make subtler or finer refinements on that. But the implication that you're off balance, certainly physically, is your muscles tighten. Because if you're off balance, you kind of have to hold yourself to keep from falling. As you get more on balance, your muscles can relax more and more, and the skeletal structure will transfer the weight to the chair or to the ground. And as you start to play with that, you'll hit a certain amount of tension relaxation that's, how do I want to call it, that's easy to achieve that you can find yourself easily achieving if you kind of play off balance and then come back on. You'll just feel there's a natural relaxation. And if we follow that to the next level, you'll find there's a relaxation in the breathing. Okay, so when you've hit a certain level that's sort of as relaxed as you naturally would get, then I want you to tighten a little bit. And I'm going to play with tightening every muscle in the body. I know you can't exactly do that, but play with the game of trying to get your feet and your hands. And just a little bit of tension, just a little bit of contraction. And then release. I think you can feel that relaxation becomes very easy once you've tightened a little bit. The distinction becomes very clear. And appreciate what's going on when you do that. That means just bring your attention into connection with your experience. Pay attention to what you're experiencing. When you can do that, you notice you're getting mad before you get too mad. You notice you're getting uh, 
losing your attention before you completely fall asleep at the wheel, as it were, in whatever phase of your life. So as you're relaxing now, I want you to do the same game of finer and finer increments. Tighten every muscle in your body, contract just the teeniest bit. And then let go and watch the sense of expansion to the channel of energy that you are. Or the simple relaxation of the musculature, if we look at it on the simple physical level. And as I said, we start there. We start with the breath. We start with the muscles. We start with what we can feel, obviously. And as we start to do that, you begin to recognize subtler and subtler levels of your being. And you begin to have power at subtler and subtler levels. As I always said, when I'm teaching Aikido, I'm not activating the body. I'm not affecting my partner's body. I'm activating the energies that activate the body. And I'm affecting my partner in the domain of the energies that move their body. So it becomes their energy that then moves their body. I'm working in harmony with a subtler level. Similar way here. Teeny, teeny bit of contraction, just enough. And the game then becomes, can you contract throughout the whole system? And of course, in the beginning, it's usually much more shoulders, belly, or back, or something to tighten right away. And then you realize, oh yeah, the jaw, or the, the hands, you can contract the hands, or the feet, or the calves. Or, and we'll start to get much more um, whole and total in our thing. But just a little bit and then relax again and feel the expansion. Stillness and movement, contraction and expansion. So the movement now becomes contracting and releasing and expanding. And now the teeniest bit of contraction and let go. And it helps you. There's an exercise they do in sitting, which is if you relax your belly, and then relax your shoulders. Maybe do it once more. Relax your belly. Relax your shoulders. You kind of get to a point where it's sort of like your belly's sort of relaxed. Now watch what happens to your belly if you relax your shoulders a little bit more. And then watch what happens to your shoulders as you relax your belly a little bit more. And that becomes kind of a what I call a cheap trick. Just a simple way to hit finer and finer levels of relaxation. So again, playing with just starting to contract and releasing to expansion and appreciating the difference, appreciating what you feel. And then there's solidification and fluidity. And if you can feel yourself I want you to try and go finer than the muscles, or really what this means is the muscles that are closest to the bones, and start to hold your body in kind of a rigid form, and then more fluid. All right, so I'm wondering how we're doing. I want you to stop me if I'm not making sense, if you're lost, if there's any help I could give you before we take this into now a little bit of motion. So we've done the extraordinary listening breath. When you start to get a little more advanced, the extraordinary listening breath becomes listening for the source of the impulse to breathe. You're not only listening to the impulse, but you're listening to the source. We did the Masogi breath. We talked about the audible breath, the silent breath, and the invisible breath. We talked about movement and stillness, contraction, expansion, solidity and fluidity. And now we want to talk about unification and division. And the way I'm going to play with that again in the physical realm easily is to start by expanding your fingers. So we're just doing the hands. Now begin to extend the elbows and the hands. And we're unifying those two as we're dividing them from the rest of the body. And then let's start to include the forearms or the shoulders. Is there a question? Your audio is breaking up. Please move a little bit closer to your microphone. 
Thank you. You're having trouble hearing me. Correct. Are we doing okay here? Yes. Please continue. Sorry to disturb. Not, no, thank you very much, Lauren. I really appreciate that. Um, so let's start to move the shoulders and the arms and holding the torso still. All right. So we start to play with now the arms, elbows, wrists, shoulders all become a unified motion and we're dividing them from the rest of the body. Now I'm going to invite you to do this standing, which is going to be my preference. And tell me if you can still hear me here. I'll speak up a little bit. Is this okay? Very good. No problem. All right. And now I'm going to teach you, um, as I've talked about the yoga in three easy lessons, the oxygenation, the breathing, and there are many, many forms of it. But I just stay with slower and deeper if you want to work on it. And if you want to connect those two, the extraordinary listening breath, that simplicity is more than enough for the first 20 years of practice. And then the second part of yoga and three lessons is activation. And the third is appreciation. And that means noticing what all these things are doing, how you're feeling differently, noticing what's going on for you so that you become much more aware of the space that you're in, how you're inhabiting that space, how you're affecting other people's space, and you become much more powerful in terms of having the kind of influence you'd like. So the three stretches that I do in the activation phase as an introduction, and we're going to go beyond this, but for, for the simple, especially those of us who are aging, to keep yourself from losing range of motion are, uh, and, and to take your body out of sleep mode into activating, most of the yoga asanas, the postures, are designed to... Uh, activate the spine and stimulate and wake up from sleep mode the nerves that are in the spine. So three simple exercises, forward and back. And, you know, gently, it, you'd be surprised how little it takes to keep your body awake, alert, to keep it from calcifying as you get older or just being stiff. You know, when I was younger, I didn't need to do much. My body was pretty flexible. Now, it doesn't take but a few days if I don't do my exercises. So anyway, just the simplest forward and back, okay? Side to side. And I like to add the arm because it helps stretch a little bit more. Side to side. And I start off pretty gently and then twist. And I don't stretch really at first. What I do, it's like I, uh, it's like I ring the, I call somebody up on the telephone and their phone rings and they pick up. I, I'm calling my nerves and muscles right now. I'm just saying, hey, in a minute, I'm going to stretch you. And um, when you're ready, pick up the phone and we'll do some real stuff. So three stretches, forward, back, and whatever feels good to you is probably right as long as you're being safe uh, to your balance, where you're not going to lose your balance and fall down and hurt yourself. Uh, and if you're worried about that, you can do these same exercises sitting in a chair uh, and be a little safer or uh, find a padded room somewhere like a dojo, you know, put a mat down, whatever. Uh, I think if you're careful, it should be safe. But again, I, I can't encourage you enough to just take good care of yourself. There's nothing that we're trying to accomplish other than enjoying ourselves. So forward and back, side to side, and twist. Okay, everybody with me? Pretty simple. And you'll find that these three exercises do an amazing uh, amount of activating and stretching the, it's not just the muscles and even the, the ligaments, it's actually the neural activation that takes place when you do this and you become a much more aware person. You combine that with the oxygenation and 
uh, your state of being is different. It's like going from a room where there's hardly any light and you're looking around for things and someone turns the rheostat up or turns the light on and all of a sudden you see the world differently. This is what these changes can bring. All right. So when we combine them, they become even more powerful. Now I'm going to add a little more complexity to this basic activation. And it's what I call the articulations. And um, if this is at all hard to remember, there's a, a video on the, on the Moon Sensei channel. Uh, and all you have to do is search as yoga in three easy lessons. And I recommend the six minute version. I, I put a few different versions up, but you can take a look and that'll just help you remind these pieces or write them down or I'll try to remember to put them all in my notes that I send out. All right, so the first articulation doing the um, division and, and unification part of it is just the head. Try and keep the shoulders and the torso solidified and just bring the head forward and back and you'll find this kind of activates the nerves and muscles in a certain area of the body. Clearly the upper region, neck and shoulders. Okay, forward and back, side to side. And I can see myself kind of moving my shoulders a little bit. I'm going to try not to. I, what happened was I stretched further than I should have. So go easy. It's, we're not trying to get to anywhere, but you can see I'm ambitious too. Just side to side. And then twist. And you can do these at a very, very subtle level. Where you, you almost can't see that I'm moving. I think you're probably watching close enough that you can. But nobody would notice you were doing this particularly. Do it slowly. And, and it starts the uh, neural channels opening and the key, chi, starts to flow in a more uh, balanced sort of way. All right. The second articulation is the shoulders. So we're going to try and hold the torso still. Probably won't stay exactly still. Don't worry about it. It's just an approximate. So we're going to do the head and shoulders come forward and back. And the shoulders don't move that far off the torso. But I think you can feel that division from the torso to the shoulders or that articulation as I like to call it. Okay. Side. To side, notice I'm trying to keep the torso relatively um, solid or still. And twist. Now we can divide that and unify the head and shoulders back and forth, forward and back. Side to side and twist. Now you don't get a lot of motion, but the stimulation that takes place in your system is very important. And if you're okay with that, then we add the torso. And now I'm going to kind of hold my um, head and shoulders unified with the torso. Forward and back. Side to side and twist. Now we start to unify them. We move the whole system, letting the head and the shoulders and the torso go as far as it feels good to you. Back as far as it feels good to you. And I'd say always, see the signs up here say less 10%. I'd always say, don't go, don't go all the way. Go basically 80, 90% of the way that's there. And, and then you can start to, um, oh, I think we did side to side with the, and then the twist.
And you should already be feeling kind of an activation in the, the system at this point. If you're still with the listening breath, you're oxygenating as you do this, there should be a little more glow of vitality. Does that work for you? All right, and then what you might want to do is play with the combination of unification and division in the sense of, let's, let's do turning first. I'm going to turn first my torso, then my shoulders, then my head. I'm going to come back, go the other way. First my torso, then my shoulders, then my head. And you can feel as you're doing this where your body wants to go, how much feels like, oh yeah, that, that's helping. Uh uh, that's enough. Oh, a little more might help, whatever, all right? Do the, just the opposite. First the head, then the shoulders, then the torso. First the head, then the shoulders, then the torso. Side to side. First the head, then the shoulders, then the torso. First the head, then the shoulders, then the torso. You got the game? So you can play with these in that way. How are we doing? Is everybody okay with this? I want to start to uh, bring them together if you've got the basics. All right, so now you can combine, let's say, side to side with a twist. And forward and back, obviously, we're going through the whole thing. And you just start to get a, a movement. At this point, you can begin to work the legs a little bit. I, at my age particularly, I like to work the, the heel a little bit. So I'm getting my calf muscles uh, a little bit of a stretch. They tend to, to be uh, <laughs> pretty tight at this point. But whatever it is, it, the thing is, it's not that you need to stretch that much. It's that when you stretch, the flexibility of your being, the flexibility of the tissue maintains itself. When you don't stretch, then the contraction seems to hold and it becomes harder and harder to do it. There's an actual calcification that takes place in the body and it gets to the point where you almost can't stretch it. When I was, you know, I started yoga at, I don't know, 19 or something like that. Um, when I was, you know, in my 20s, I wake up in the morning, I put my head to my knees. Now I can't put my head to my knees even after I stretch. But I can put my hands on the floor here or whatever. Um, somewhere about my 40s, I, uh, I could get down to about here. And it just shocked me because I'd always been so flexible. I hadn't been paying attention to it. And so I just started going to here. And I'd let myself stay there as long as I wanted. And... I'd come back up. And just the fact that I would do it started to return the elasticity to my system. Keep listening to your impulse to breathe. And after a little while, I kind of, oh yeah, it started to get kind of flexible again, you know. And, and then I just kept doing it. And then I could, all of a sudden, I could touch my toes again and put my hands on the floor, whatever. So the, the thing that I'm trying to say to you is uh, not to try and go for that, but rather the opposite. Just do a little, and 10% and less than you think you should. And uh, it's the repetition. It's the doing, if you just did this every day, no more than that, one second, two seconds. The difference in five years, <laughs> and when you get to be my age, you know, if you had done that versus not doing it, that little bit, I think you can imagine that the compound interest produces an incredible result. And of course, if you did a little more than that, I, I talk about my three second meditation, you know, align. When you do that, again, the muscles start to relax and you allow, as you appreciate that, you become a more positive spirit in the world. There's no reason you couldn't do that for two seconds of aligning, getting more subtle and aligning and allowing at the same time, you start to unify them and then appreciating what's going on. It changes who you are. And I want to check and say, are you with me now? Are we good? Yes. Good. Good. Any questions? I want to try and do something here. I'm not sure how this is going to work. I want to take us into a little bit more motion following these principles, but I 
Happy to take a second before we do. And uh, if anyone has a question for Moon Sensei, please unmute and speak. Please. All right. Let's take the motion and, and do feel free to, to kind of shout out if you need any help or or we need to uh, clarify anything, whatever. Um, but okay, I think we started last time, uh, went into improv theater, okay? You were just sleeping, you got up from sleep, and you just uh, do some yawning and some uh, kind of stretching and whatever. And what I'm looking for in this is very much, very much what the extraordinary listening breath is. That's a tuning in to your impulse to breathe somewhere in the body. And it may be that your impulse at the moment is to go very still, and I'm fine with that, and you should listen to that if that's what calls you. But even there, you'll find that there's a little bit of vibration, pulsation that's going on. But now I'm gonna back to the improv theater thing of somebody waking up and starting to stretch a little bit. And I'm just saying, now look for any movement that feels good to you. Anything that you'd like to do, and I particularly like articulating the wrists and the elbows and the shoulders and the hips and the spine and the twists and the flows. Okay? And just feel like, is there any muscle that would just like a little bit of a stretch to help it strengthen or become more flexible? Okay? Now tell me if this works, and we're just going to do a couple minutes. Can you hear this? Yes. If it helps. I'm really only going to give you two or three minutes, but you can do this on your own with your favorite music anytime. I like a little music. I like to do it to silence as well. And of course, those of us Aikido people, we can play with our imaginary ukes at any point we want. And do our irimi nages and our kodagaishis and our nikyos and whatever, whatever calls you. And I like to do a bit of that. But I, I tend to like to do kokinage mostly, meaning there's no visible technique per se. It's just Kokyu, the power that moves the breath, not the air itself, the energy that activates life, the spirit of aliveness. And to me, it's like whatever movement would feel good to you, however small, however big, however slow, However fast, whatever calls you. And stay with the listening breath, listening to the impulse to breathe, listening to the impulse to move, unifying mind, body, spirit, combining the twists and the forwards and the backs and the whatever, dividing the pieces, unifying the whole system, whatever's fun for you. And we're going to do one more minute here. So if there's any part of your body that you haven't given expression to or allowed it to express itself. Last little bits here. And then I'm going to come from as big a movement as you can make, reaching as expanded as you can be. And then just gradually over the next 60 seconds, bring it back into smaller and smaller, gradually, and stiller, and bringing movement and expansion and fluidity into stillness and solidity 
And then I want to play for a last second here with what I call the power under the mat. Just start to feel that your weight is actually going into the earth. And the earth is coming up to support you, as it were. And if you can feel yourself let go of your weight, just let it go. And the, notice how beautifully the earth comes up and holds you. You don't fall into empty space. There's a unification of yourself with the planet. And if we had a lot more time, I'd go into the universal connection and we may get to that at some point, maybe next week or the last week. Okay? And when you're ready, bring yourself back to your chairs and why don't we just chat for a minute as we wrap it up. I'm just going to go really quickly over a couple of the basics. Extraordinary listening breath, the Masogi breath, the silent, the audible, the silent, and the invisible breath. And those were ways of playing with helping you connect your attention with your experience of breathing, unify the you that you know with that aspect of you that is subtler than we usually pay attention to. Okay? We did uh, some movement in terms of stillness into movement, movement back into stillness, expanding, contracting, being more fluid, more solid, and feeling the parts and feeling the whole. Okay? We did the forward, back, side to side twist of the movements to activate the spine. And we did the three articulations of head, shoulders, and torso. Okay, and then we just started playing with what I call the extraordinary listening movement. And uh, really, it's a doorway into what we used to teach as Aiki dance. And I think we'll try and do that a bit before we're done with these four classes. And it's mostly to me, I, I love all the systems and all the forms I've studied. I appreciate going to someone's yoga class and having them teach some stuff. And especially when you're new to the art, it's, it's really good to have that. But um, the thing that I like about the extraordinary listening breath and the extraordinary listening movement and the Aiki dance process are that they come from you at this moment in your life expressing or allowing or serving whatever needs serving, whatever wants to be expressed, whatever is perfect for you at this moment. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do the other stuff. I think you should do the other stuff. It's really great to learn from everyone and every system. But I think it's more important in the long run that all that feeds into your connection with your inner teacher or what I say is your connection to the Aiki Kami. And it's like I said last time, I don't really consider myself a teacher. I see myself as a, as a senior student. And um, maybe I can help a few people in their study. And I said, even Bob, I, I see Bob as senpai, senior in the process. I see Osensei as senior in the process. And Osensei taught us something really magical when this started to happen. The way he described it was the Aikikami would come and wake him up in the middle of the night and take him out in the garden and teach him Aikido, Aikido movements. I was just talking to Bob yesterday and he was saying, yeah, he just get this feeling where Bob, this is Bob talking about himself, where he'd just wake up in the middle of the night and he'd get up and he'd start writing and musing on some parts of the art. To me, that's the Aikikami waking Bob up and taking him out and teaching him or working with him on developing his Aikido. And so I see them all as inspirations and God knows how much appreciation I have for Bob and an infinite appreciation for Osensei for what he did. But when this started to happen for him, uh, he was studying with Sakaku Takeda in the Daituru Aiki Jiu Jitsu format. And Takeda dropped by the dojo and he's watching him and he kind of goes, hey, Mori, you know, your, your uh, Daituru Aiki Jiu Jitsu is getting a little weird. And I was talking to one of the guys who was saying, you know, in those days you had to sign a a form that said you would not change any of the movements and all that stuff. 
And I think this is the place where I'm saying to you, stay with the Aikikami because that's what Osensei taught us. He said, he could have said in the typical Japanese fashion, hi, sensei, yes, you know, whatever, and done whatever he was told. God bless him, he didn't. He said to Takeda, he said, okay, I just won't call it Daichu Ryu Aiki Jiu Jitsu. And so I'm inviting you, not necessarily you have to call it anything different, but I think, and you have to check with your inner teacher and your connection to O Sensei and your line up to whatever's right for you, I would say that O Sensei would be very happy to see you exploring and experimenting. He said, the first stage of my Aiki Budo has come to an end and serves as a stepping stone for the second stage. So my last piece here is, uh, and Bob and I've talked about this repeatedly. Bob said way back, he said, well, since he didn't expect us all to become great martial artists, most of us aren't martial artists. I mean, Bob is, I'm not. Uh, he said, oh, sensei was saying through the mastery that he brought, that he showed in the martial arts realm, because he was a martial artist, that he said, if you understand the spirit of Aiki, if you can harmonize with the universe, if you and the universe become one, then you can show this mastery in your work in your parenting, in your painting or your art, in your business acumen, in your design, in your cooking, in your, you can bring this magic everywhere in the world. And that's what I believe he was trying to share with us. Now, like I said, if your inner teacher agrees with me, then your inner teacher agrees. If your inner teacher says no, then I don't care. I would never take anything on my authority. And if your inner teacher says, I don't know, let me think about that. Well, please think about it. Yeah, it's, it's your art now. It's yours to play with now. And, and I hope these just open doorways for you. Yeah, again, I, I say the spirit of play is the best thing you can bring to your art. And um, so Sensei said, you know, I do the three easy lessons of feel where you are, move into a harmonious relationship, and then just express what the unification of you and your partner's energy produces. Share who you are. Uh, and then I, I came across and, and um, you know, Lauren studied with Mr. Hikasuchi for many years and put out a video of him. And I can't thank you enough, Lauren, because I don't know what else we'd have of him at this point. Uh, but he was one of the exceptional ones, you know, 10th degree and all that. And he said, oh, sensei always taught that love gives birth to harmony Harmony brings forth joy, and joy is the greatest treasure. And I thought, that's why I studied with this guy, because his three lessons were so much better than mine. But it tickled me no end to see that he had kind of had this basic fundamental. And I, 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 I think that there's magic in the movements because we're not doing this. We're doing, you know, this. And we become more flowing and more blending. But I think if you understand this essential aspect of the art, when you practice your techniques, they're a way for you to practice the art. They're not the art. They're Aikiwaza. The Do is the essence of Aikido. I'm quoting the old man now. The essence of Aikido is the cultivation of the spirit of reconciliation. So I want to acknowledge Lauren and Kenneth. Uh, you guys have no idea what these guys put out to make this stuff happen. And it's better that you don't on one level, but let me just say thank you to both of them, to all of you, and I look forward to working with you next week. Thank you very much, Sensei. And uh, we'll end class with this sound. Thank you again.